Cincinnati Zoo is often regarded for its gardens, rare animals, their breeding programs of those rare animals, and their absolutely, positively, well-preserved history. But this time, nearly eight years in the making and $33 million spent, we'll be taking a trip to Africa. And based on the thumbnail and title alone, I assure you that this isn't your common African excursion. Along the way, I'll show you the plains, rivers, and deserts of this very geographically diverse continent spread out amongst five separate phases sitting on just eight acres. Not only this, but we'll meet the iconic inhabitants and world celebrities that call this development their home. The main entrance, or at least the way you'd see it, is located about midway throughout our journey. But to save that for later, we'll be starting just south and right of that at phase number one. Welcome to the 2008 Giraffe Ridge, a roughly 27,000 square foot, mostly open space that blends in perfectly with the background. The ridge is home to, I want to say, about five or so Maasai giraffes, known unlike other giraffe subspecies for their almost star-like patterns that extend from head to toe. Another thing that I forgot to mention is that the zoo also has a pretty good track record of keeping this exhibit stocked with calves and according to my research, since 2011, seven have been born here at the zoo. As if that isn't saying a lot, way back in 1889, the zoo was actually the first place in the country to breed them. Here in Cincinnati, you can meet them at eye level, at the railing, of course depending on the time of day, you can feed them, and moving on, just a bit more to the right, you can actually get a peek into multiple 2,500 square foot indoor stalls. But if this isn't it, the thing that makes it stand out from most other giraffe exhibits we've seen or we will eventually see is the Tigua Camp, where to further your safari experience, you and your party can stay overnight and awake to a beautiful panoramic view. Moving on and down the boardwalk, the path brings you to another miniature plaza area with a flamingo exhibit, or what used to be, that overlooks the ridge one last time. But eventually, the guest movement will likely direct your attention to a small, but still not to be forgotten, interpretive display where occasionally keepers will bring out multiple, often forgotten critters for you to get a hands-on experience. Anyways, past this, and what we'll be seeing shortly, is a single, one-way path that leads to the cheetah encounter. In other words, a presentation area where on appropriate days, you can watch the world's fastest land mammal demonstrate their stellar speed, but with them, the show also often includes a serval, a red river hog, and a porcupine to go along with them too. Backtracking just a little ways back is our first look at phase number three, and no African exhibit would ever be complete without the African lion the southeastern subspecies to be exact. You can not only meet them, and I mean meet them, here at this large viewing shelter, but to your left is a much more open and unobstructed view into their kingdom. The Cincinnati Zoo is currently home to two cats in particular, male John from the Smithsonian and female Amani 
from St. Louis, both of which arriving in the Queen City just in time for their exhibit's opening. Just a year after that, the couple became parents to Free Cubs sisters, who would eventually go to continue growing the captive lion population in the AZA. Once again, the pair is now alone, but as always, they seem to be enjoying life in one of the country's better homes for lions. Their space stretches past this, all the way down to the waterline, where all that separates them from guests is a short leap, but as can usually be seen, they can actually look out over their territory from Fried Rock. That would be Phase 4 at what's commonly known as the African Plains. At 35,000 square feet, it is undoubtedly the largest exhibit in the entire zoo, which can also be referred to as an oasis. Again, separating you from the animals is a small moat that flows into their neighbor's habitat via a waterfall dividing the two. The savanna is home to a 11 species mix. Anyways, starting with the birds, in here you'd find the Kenyan crested guinea fowl, both Rupel's griffin, and the much more aggressive lapid faced vultures, along with the pink backed pelican, residing in the continents, shallow swamps, and lakes, given their name for their pink back underparts. With them are the gray crowned cranes, as well as my personal favorites, the saddle billed storks, also the tallest of their kind. They are commonly known for their large red bills containing a iconic black band and a yellow facial shield, forming a saddle. Finally, the no-shows, the zoo's two, I believe, female ostriches. Now onto the mammals. There's the Thompson's gazelle, a very popular choice in zoos, and also on the same topic as the cheetahs, they are the fourth fastest land animal in the world. Following them are the impala, as well as a lesser kudu who didn't want to be seen, and concluding with Mike, a single white bearded wildebeest. And well, I guess it can be said that despite lacking in size, this savanna definitely makes up for that species wise by having so much to offer. Turning your attention directly around and continuing phase four is the roughly 16 and a half thousand square foot painted dog valley complete with simulated rock work, natural fauna shaded by multiple birch trees and a shallow stream that flows throughout the middle of the exhibit leading to two pools on either side. The African wild or painted dog is one of the continent's rarest and therefore most endangered animals with a wild population of about 1,400 dispersed throughout the southern and eastern parts of Africa. Oftentimes in the wild, they'll be found living in groups called packs of 7 to 15 individuals, although some have been recorded with upwards of 40. Anyways, over the years, Cincinnati has been home to at least 32 pups, and that's saying a lot. They get their name from their distinctively varied blotches and color patterns lining their pelts, and unlike other canines, they actually only have four toes, lacking the need of their dew claws, supposedly, according to the zoo, placed underneath their habitat is a 400,000 gallon detention tank that collects and refilters rainwater, allowing it to be used not only here, but throughout the entirety of the zoo. Speaking of which, on a hot summer day, you're almost guaranteed to see them swim and splash around, as they are naturally very fond of water and tend to be excellent swimmers. 
So we continue, and closing out Phase 4 with Life on the Desert is a smaller but still very adequate open top tome formerly for Batyard Foxes, now occupied by the zoo's mob of meerkats. Heading over to the far side is your chance to get a 360 degree view into their world from a pop-up bubble, and also around here, built into the rock work, is a peek into their indoor space, but since they weren't really fans of the rain, we'll be moving on. Next, following this and nearing the end of our journey, is Phase 5, the 2016's Hippo Cove, a exhibit made famous by, well, you'll just have to wait and see. Anyways, the cove's viewing is 65 feet long, allowing visitors to experience both above and underwater views into 70,000 gallons of water, which cost the zoo about seven and a half million dollars and well despite resembling most other hippo exhibits out there it's often regarded as smaller than the others after this exhibit's opening and the hippo's reintroduction to the zoo it all started with male henry from the dickerson park zoo and female bb from st louis a few years later and after henry's passing on January 24th, 2007, Phoebe gave birth six weeks earlier than planned to a premature calf weighing only 29 pounds, aka Princess Fiona, the most famous animal to ever live, at least at one point. Almost instantly, the zoo's animal care team stepped in, monitoring her around the clock through the ups and downs eventually teaching her how to walk, swim, and of course, reuniting her with her family. Nowadays, and if you couldn't already tell, she has a massive fan base, where she splashed her way, get it, into the hearts of millions around the globe, inspiring others to fight like Fiona. In fact, her birth helped the zoo hit a record attendance in what they called the Fiona effect. I mean, just seeing her gives you bragging rights. Not to mention that she even has her own flavor of ice cream, a TV show, and was campaigned to be the Time Magazine's Person of the Year. Now, if you ever hear anyone claim that she's just another hippo, I will hunt them down. No, I'm kidding, but they're wrong. This once underweight and premature little hippo who had slim chance of survival, is now healthy and living her best life. Continuing on once more, past our final look at the meerkats, and some backtracking later, around the area of the Plains exhibit, is the main entrance, and tucked away in a corner where a aviary and baboons were supposed to be, is a small, and well-shaded yard for the zoos off exhibit cheetahs to take a break while not participating in the show. And finally, also in this area, is our last stop, the Base Camp Cafe, rated the greenest restaurant in America, but it's also a favorite because it's the best place in the entire park to sit down, relax, and eat as you count the herds in the distance, and maybe even listen to a lion's roar. Africa, a true journey, and undoubtedly the zoo's greatest development in their history. And that closes out our first, but certainly not last tour of the Cincinnati Zoo. Yes, we may have reached their peak in quality, but I'm sure there will be a few more surprises around the corner. Anyways, as always, thank you for watching.